All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight here at Gonzaga University for our next uh, Climate Institute event. My name is Dr. Brian Henning. I'm the director of the Institute for Climate, Water, and the Environment. It's my pleasure to welcome you again to our latest uh, in our series of talks. This one, uh, as you know, is about Held versus Montana and the youth uh, suing the state of Montana, which we'll get to just shortly. But as you can see on the screen, we also have several uh, additional events coming up uh, that I would encourage you to register for. So please consider registering and attending these uh, events uh, one at the end of the month here on the 28th, and then on March 4th, and then two in April. Uh, so please consider registering for those and attending. As always, if you have the means to support our work, uh, whether the lecture series or work on climate literacy or climate resilience, uh, definitely helps us to expand uh, the scope of our mission. We'd always appreciate that. So I'd like to begin by um, Introducing our speakers and the way that we're going to proceed with the event tonight. So this is being uh, live streamed online and we were hoping to have one of the youth plaintiffs from Montana and uh, two of her attorneys here in person. We're going to be here. Uh, and, and unfortunately, because of some bad weather uh, in between here at Montana and when you're holding an event in February, I guess this is always, always a risk. They decided not to risk coming over the pass uh, today. And so everything will be, the, all the, the panelists will be remote, and my colleague and I will be here in person moderating the conversation. They have some comments, but a lot of it is going to be opportunities, hopefully, for you to also think about asking questions that you might have uh, for our panelists. And so that'll be a, a good opportunity. And I'll try and keep an eye on my phone, too. If you're at home uh, somewhere else in the world and have a question, uh, you can email climateinstitute at gonzaga.edu. So just climate institute at gonzaga.edu and I'll look at my phone every now and then and if you have a good question I'll try and pose that as well so feel free to do that. So um, now I'd like to introduce our, our, our panelists who can um, see if they can bring themselves off of mute and see if we can get technology to cooperate here. Here we go. All right so our uh, one of the, the person I'm most excited to hear from and to introduce is, of course, one of the youth plaintiffs. Uh, Eva uh, is uh, 17 years old and a senior from Livingston, Montana. Uh, Montana's rivers, forests, and mountains have always been an important part of Eva's life. It's where she experienced her favorite activities like climbing, rafting, skiing, swimming, biking, hiking, camping, and backpacking, all those things we love to do here in the inland northwest. However, rising temperatures and abnormal precipitation trends due to the climate crisis have harmed Eva and many people uh, in her community. Frequent wildfires and smoke nearby have created poor air quality in Livingston, Montana, where she lives, and more rapid snowmelt has caused severe flooding in her area. Eva remembers uh, what they call the, apparently the tsunami of 2018, which maybe we'll hear about, a flood on the Shields River that severely damaged a bridge near her home that her family needed to drive over to get into Livingston. She's joined by two of her attorneys who are part of a team uh, that represented her and, and other youth in Montana in their lawsuit that we'll also hear from. Uh, the first is Barbara Chilcott. She uh, is an attorney. Both of, the, of these attorneys are from the Western Environmental Law Center, um, of which I'm a, a board member, uh, or WELC. Barbara joined WELC in 2021 after 15 years of work uh, on water law and policy in Montana. Originally from South Carolina, Barbara earned a BA in economics from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and her law degree at the University of Montana School of Law. She previously worked to restore in-stream flows across Montana as a project manager and executive director of a statewide water trust. She joined Welk after working as an attorney for the Montana Department of Natural Resources and Conservation for five years on water rights and law policy. Our other speaker or panelist today is Melissa Hornbein. Melissa, as a Welk attorney, she joined Welk in, in 2020 after working in state and federal government. She holds a BS in botany and a JD from the University of, of uh, Washington's Hastings College of Law. And she's also earned a Master's of Science in Environmental Studies from the University of Montana. Before practicing as an attorney, Melissa worked in the field as a botanist uh, and a technician for various academic and governmental en entities, including the National Park Service and the U.S. Geological Survey. 
you could tell uh, just by their biographies that they really have an interesting perspective on this work, and I'm really excited uh, to hear a little bit about what motivated them to pursue this particular course of action to try and get Montana to address uh, the climate crisis, what it is for youth uh, to be leading that, and what it is to be an attorney to try and help young people in that work. So please join me in welcoming our panelists this evening. So I'm not sure if uh, one of you was most interested in speaking first, um, <laughs> whatever your plan is, I'm happy to turn over to you for a little while if you had a little bit of presentation before we pepper you with some questions. Sure, um, and you know, we have a few slides that we thought we'd share that to kind of capture um, the you know, essence and the, the images from the, the case and the trial that occurred last June in Montana. Um, so we are hoping the three of us will, you know, can give a brief overview. And um, and I should just um, pause and say thank you so much for having us here tonight, and um, and for accommodating our um, need to appear remotely to kind of save our white knuckles from um, driving across three mountain passes actually in the snow. So thanks so much. Um, so I think um, at this point I'll um, share my screen. Great, and I'm, you know, we're kind of just using these slides as a, a way to kind of set the stage for you all um, who weren't, uh, you know, a lot of you, most of you maybe were not able to join us in Helena in June of this past year um, for the trial um, that was quite remarkable. So, um, you know, I'll just start off with a little um, background on our involvement, my involvement, and then turn it over to both Eva and Melissa to do the same. Um, so as Brian said, I am a, um, an attorney with the Western Environmental Law Center. Um, we are co-counsel with um, two other law firms in this litigation, um, our Children's Trust, which is a public interest law firm based in Eugene, Oregon, who is um, spearheading these uh, youth climate uh, cases across the country and internationally. Um, we also partnered with another law firm called the McGarvey Law Firm based here in Montana up in Kalispell. Um, and so uh, we have kind of a really awesome group of attorneys um, that, uh, you know, has been, we, speaking for myself, been so fortunate to work with these awesome group of plaintiffs um, who are from across Montana. Um, so I will uh, turn it over to kind of Melissa to um, to give kind of the background on on her involvement, our involvement in the case, and uh, then to Eva. Sounds good. Thanks, Barbara. Um, like Barbara, I, I just feel so fortunate to have had the opportunity to work with these plaintiffs, um, who are just an incredible group of young people, and. Um, the Western Environmental Law Center got involved with this case actually almost, well, more than a decade ago in 2011, uh, not the same group of plaintiffs, but a subset of these plaintiffs um, brought a case which is called an original action before the Montana Supreme Court in 2011. And the court at that time told them, no, you have to go back. You have to start in district court. Um, and then, you know, if it gets up on appeal, we'll hear your case. So that was kind of the seeds of this case. And um, neither Barbara nor I were at Welk at the time. Um, but my colleague Shiloh, our, our former colleague Shiloh Hernandez was, and along with Roger Sullivan and our Children's Trust, they were really pivotal in um, framing the legal claims for this case and did so very much informed by a lawsuit that many of you may have heard of, um, the Juliana case, also known as Youth v. Gov, uh, which is our Children's Trust's federal challenge uh, to actions taken by the United States government, which allow climate change to continue to get worse and accumulate. And that case has gone through various ups and downs, but having the benefit of that federal case 
really was formative in terms of the claims that were brought here. And there's just so much good legal thought and analysis that went into beginning this case and framing it. Um, the case itself was filed in March of um, 2018. And I am going to turn it over to Eva here since that was actually her birthday. And it seems appropriate that she should talk about that experience because I actually wasn't involved with the case until shortly after that. Um, and I just would love to hear her perspective on how she got involved and kind of what that felt like, or I'm, and I apologize, not 2018, 2020, it was the beginning of COVID. Um, and so, yeah, I'm going to turn it over to you, Eva, and um, you can introduce yourself and talk about getting involved with this case, if you would. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so uh, just beforehand, apologies about any background noises. My house is quite loud. Um, uh, for starters, you know, it was, yeah, I think it was the very beginning of 2020, and I had heard about this lawsuit and um, through the, an organization that my mom worked for. And I was just really curious about finding a way to sort of get active and get into act climate change activism because, you know, I was feeling a little bit hopeless and depressed about climate change at the time. And I would, you know, I would see things on the news and I would read things and it would be, you know, it'd be kind of petty for me. And I would often think about just sort of what could I do? And when this opportunity came up, I was excited and I reached out to our children's trust and, um, got on a phone call, we got talking and the case, yeah, was filed on my 14th birthday, which also happened to be, um, I think it was like the same day some of the lockdowns started happening in Montana. So, um, it was really kind of crazy from the get go because there was all sorts of turmoil happening in our world around us. And, um, this, the beginning of this case. So, yeah, it was, it was really cool to, at the beginning, you know, I didn't really know what to expect. And I was, I think, a little bit, like, nervous and excited. And I think there was, I was hopeful that something would happen, but I had no idea that we would get this far. Yeah, thanks, Eva. And, um, you know, I think you that was nice foreshadowing to kind of help us um, now let everyone know where we are in this case and kind of back up a, a minute to explain the case a little bit and um, and where we are today. And so I'll give it, a, I'll start that process and um, or that part of the conversation here. And um, so as Melissa and Eva just discussed, we filed a complaint in the state of Montana district court um, in Helena in Lewis and Clark County in March of 2020. And the lawsuit is um, filed on behalf of 16 young people in the state of Montana um, from all over the state, really, um, and um, from all kind of different walks of life. And the defendants in the case are, you know, the state of Montana and the agencies of the state that are responsible for permitting uh, fossil fuel activities in the state. Um, we challenged two different statutes um, as unconstitutional for violating um, these plaintiffs' constitutional right to a clean and healthful environment. Um, in Montana, we have a, a pretty unique provision in our constitution that protects um, our rights as Montana citizens to a clean and healthful environment. Um, and so that was the one of the primary um, kind of claims in our lawsuit that um, the state, one, um, had an energy policy that uh, really promoted the use and development of fossil fuels. And two, the state's um, environmental review statute, which is uh, many of you may have heard of the National Environmental Policy Act. But in Montana, we um, have what's uh, called a, a mini NEPA called the Montana Environmental Policy Act. And that statute um, that we challenged basically said that the state of Montana was precluded from looking at climate change or greenhouse gas emissions in any environmental analysis conducted to um, to uh, look at permitting for fossil fuel activities or any activity really. Um, so, the the case after quite a long um, extended period of pretrial work, including about thirty six depositions. Um, 
uh, putting together expert reports from 22 of our experts um, in climate science and renewable energy transition and public health and children's health and um, and then um, you know exchanging about 50,000 plus page of documents throughout the the pretrial litigation. We finally made it to trial in June of last year. And that was a pretty remarkable experience where um, we had a seven day trial. Um, Eva and her fellow plaintiffs were able to um, get on the stand and tell the judge um, the climate um, harms that they've been experiencing in Montana. Um, and coupled with the, the plaintiff's testimony, we had a testimony from our experts who really um, you know, basically put the plaintiff's real lived experiences in, co in the context of the climate crisis and really validated the, um, the harms and the, the challenges these young people are facing now living in Montana that Eva can describe um, really eloquently. <laughs> um, and then finally, um, we uh, wrapped up the trial, and this is a big nutshell here, but <laughs> wrapped up the trial and then um, received a favorable order from the state district court judge in August of last, uh, last year. Um, the state of Montana has appealed the decision now to the Montana Supreme Court, um, and we are right in the throes of um, briefing right now. The state um, just filed their opening brief in that appeal yesterday and the day before. Um, there are a number of what are called friends of the court who are now filing briefs on, um, well, now on the part of the state to kind of, um, you know, bolster the state's arguments that um, that the judge made a mistake um, in her decision. Um, we will be filing our briefs in about a month and will likewise have um, some friends of the court um, filing briefs on behalf of the plaintiffs. Um, as well. So it's quite, um, it, it's not the same as, you know, having a trial in person once we get up to the appeal level, but it's quite remarkable the interest that we've seen and then the, the briefs coming in from all over the place to uh, weigh in on this issue. Um, and uh, it really sets the stage, I think, in Montana for, you know, setting, you know, creating this precedent that other courts um, can hopefully look to as, you um, as these uh, constitutional climate um, cases are filed uh, nationwide. So um, with that, I think um, we could turn it over to, um, let's see, would you, Melissa, did you want to weigh in a little bit more on kind of the ins and outs of the, the litigation? Um, sure, I, I can say a few words and then could, would love to, have Eva chime in with just kind of her experience of the trial process and, and that of her co-plaintiffs. Um, you know, I think Barbara just gave a really good overview of the whole process. I think one of the things that was really remarkable um, as a lawyer working on the case, well, there were many remarkable things about this case, but one of the things that I think caught us a little bit off guard um, was the extent to which the state really did not defend this case on the substance. Um, contrary to our expectations, they, while they hired experts who were essentially climate change deniers, um, they ultimately didn't use those experts at trial. And they really focused their efforts both in the pretrial phase of the case and also during trial on um, basically saying, like, this case should never have gotten to trial. They filed seven different motions to dismiss over the three years that the case was pending before the district court. And now we're seeing that same thing on appeal. They're, they're not arguing the constitutional issues so much as they are attacking the judge's decisions that sort of kept this case alive. Um, and then I think the only other point that I want to touch on and circle back to is the one Barbara raised about sort of the uniqueness of Montana's constitutional provisions. Um, Montana was sort of a, a almost a perfect storm for this case, both because of our constitutional right to a clean and healthful environment. We had a very far-sighted legislature and constitutional convention in 1972 who drafted our current constitution, um, which is 
really a remarkable document in its foresight, its thoughtfulness about how the environment sort of interplays with Montanans' everyday lives. And then the juxtaposition of that constitution with where we are now in the state, where a lot of our political leadership would like to frankly do away with those constitutional provisions and have um, not only recently, but over much of the history of the last 50 years, made this state a disproportionate producer of fossil fuels. Um, you know, we just hit a million people within the last five years, and yet we have an impact the size of a country such as Pakistan uh, in terms of our greenhouse gas emissions. And that's because we also have um, a, a disproportionate amount of fossil fuels under Montana soils, and we also have a government that has historically and continues to promote um, the extraction, combustion, and transportation of those fuels. So those two sort of disparate things of our very unique constitution with um, our government's practice of promoting fossil fuel uh, consumption and combustion made this case sort of perfect for, for this this case and the claims by these youth plaintiffs. And so pairing those things with the stories that these young people told about how climate change is impacting their lives made for really compelling theater at trial. Um, and with that, I'd love to turn it over to Eva for her account of kind of what it felt like to be in that courtroom. Well, I think I'd start by going a little before trial, um, like maybe eight months before trial when I had my deposition taken. Uh, that experience was really nerve wracking for me because it was, it felt very, you know, sort of like, it felt like a little bit like being interrogated or something, you know, there was this sort of the sense that it was, it felt very tense. Um, and so I think when I was originally being deposed, I was really worried about testifying originally. Um, and for a while, I was kind of on the fence about whether or not I should testify, which looking back on is so funny to me because it ended up being one of the most worth it. Like it was so, so worth it. Um, and when I finally was just like, you know what, you're not going to regret doing this. Um, I was, yeah, it was coming into trial. I think I was a little bit nervous. I was really, really excited. It was it was, I had a whole tangle of emotions, you know, um, I keep describing it, you know, as this sort of roller coaster at the entirety of the trial process was kind of a roller coaster. Um, from the beginning, it was, you know, there was all this information and it was really, it was, it was crazy. Cause on the first day, you know, we, we woke up pretty early and then we, um, walked to the courthouse and I remember just seeing, this crowd of supporters uh, waving signs and cheering us on as we entered the courthouse. And that was just really a special moment for me because I felt like we, wow, we really are doing this. We're walking into this courtroom right now and we're going to make history. And I was, yeah, it was for all of us. It was kind of, it was kind of incredible. You know, it was surreal. It was really hard. I think for me to originally kind of wrap my head around all of it during the process, because there's just so much I was taking in. Um, I testified on the first day of trial and I was, I think the third plaintiff to trust to testify. Um, the way we did it is we would have a plaintiff testify and then we'd have one of our expert witnesses testify, which was really cool because the plaintiffs would tell their stories, their harms, how climate change had affected them. And then the experts would go afterwards and basically take everything that they'd said and put scientific evidence behind all of that. So it was really interwoven and beautiful. And it was like a story, you know, it was really like storytelling in that way. Um, and so it was just, I, it was so like, it was, you know, it was hard at times seeing other plaintiffs testify and hearing their stories because, you know, we'd all experienced wildfires and I'd experienced flooding and we all had different impacts. People with asthma or allergies were struggling more because of, yeah, wildfire smoke. And, you know, just hearing about the different harms of the plaintiffs was really it was heavy, but it was also, there was also the sense of solidarity and getting those words out in a courtroom 
where they were on the record and they couldn't really be disputed. It was incredibly validating. I remember um, when I took the stand, I was really nervous and I was just kind of, I was really, really nervous and unsure of what to say until I, um, yeah, I got sworn in and I was like, okay, here we go. And um, though as soon as, you know, uh, Barbara asked me the first question, I kind of, it kind of everything sort of clicked, you know, I just sort of started telling my story and it was, it, I couldn't really gauge the time, you know, it felt really fast. I just sort of started talking and before I knew it, I was off the stand and I'd done that. I testified and then I got to see the rest of the plaintiffs um, testify over the course of the week. And, you know, it was just really cool to see the experts and the, t um, and the plaintiffs um, interweave their sort of with evidence and stories and also sort of seeing the state kind of scrabble for scrabble with their arguments. <laughs> so yeah, overall, I think it was, it was kind of a roller coaster. You know, there was a lot of press and reporters and that was a wild experience to sort of engage in. And it was just, it was so incredible to be a part of something that was, it, there was an overwhelming amount of support, which I was really, really, I'm so grateful for. And there still are so many people who are just incredibly supportive. And um, I'm just so grateful to all the people who are really supportive of this case. Thanks, Eva. I could just listen to you talk about that, like probably for hours. <laughs> that just brings back so much like what we went through and what we accomplished. And it was just so, so amazing. Um, I just want to show, I think, you know, maybe it's a good time now to kind of get into questions and um, have Brian take over here. Um, but I think one thing I wanted to do is just um, show a couple um, of just images to kind of, um, you know, pair with what Eva was just saying, because it was, um, yeah, it's, it's just, it was pretty cool how, um, how this all went down. Um, let me see here. So this is just, I'm assuming you can see my screen. Yeah, um, coming through this nicely. is great. Um, just kind of a scene from the courtroom where, um, we have one of the uh, the plaintiffs on the stand and um, one of the experts and just, you know, kind of just showing the scene there. Um, and, you know, it was every day the courtroom was full of people coming to watch, um, full of lawyers and plaintiffs and just members of the community who were just so supportive. And and this is a kind of an image of the, um, the plaintiffs walking in um, one of the days, maybe the first day of trial. And, you know, just this happened every single day that there were members of the community um, who would come over from across Montana and just stand and just cheer them on as they entered the courtroom. And it was just so, it was so sweet and just very um, powerful. And I think, um, yeah, it was amazing. So we had so much community support and, um, and yeah, it was just, um, what a summer that we had in Helena putting this trial on and um, we're so you know happy with the outcome and um, anticipate uh, the Montana Supreme Court will um, will you know make it even better so um, I'm gonna stop sharing now and um, thank you if so you want to take it away dr. Henning thank you so much let's give them a hand it was just uh... So much fun stuff to talk about. I forgot to introduce earlier my colleague, uh, Dr. Greg Gordon, uh, the chair of our Environmental Studies and Sciences Department, is uh, generously invited. Uh, well, I invited him to come, and he, he said yes, just to facilitate, make sure we have uh, uh, an active conversation. Uh, are you able to see me on, on your end, or am I sitting in front of the camera? Are you so? Um, so we're just going to maybe ask a couple questions. All of you could also be thinking about questions if you're at home, and we have people from around the world joining us uh, live stream. Uh, you can also email me at climateinstitute at gonzaga.edu if you have a question, we can try and, and fit it in. Uh, so I, I'd love to invite uh, Dr. Gordon up to, to join me. 
I was noticing that there are a number of different states that have uh, green amendments, and so one of the things you're talking about is this is specific, specifically with uh, Montana, and uh, you know you have this provision in your constitution. But we, how many states have these provisions in their constitutions? If you know, I don't know if that's a fair question, but is this? And you said Montana is unusual, but is it? Is it completely unique, and in, in, do other states have these provisions that they could sue under? I should say who I'm asking. Uh, <laughs> Barbara or Melissa, either one of you. <laughs> uh, I, I'll, I'll jump in, and then Barbara can correct me. I believe uh, at this time, six other states have what are loosely termed green amendments. Um, or similar constitutional provisions that protect something equivalent to the right to a clean and healthful environment. There are a number of other states who are um, working on trying to get a green amendment into their constitution. So no, Montana is not unique. Um, I think that we were somewhat uniquely situated and, and ideally situated to kind of be the first of these cases to go to trial because of the odd dichotomy that I discussed earlier between our sort of fossil fuel addiction and our constitutional language. Um, but there are other states that have that language. There's currently a case that is set to go to trial this June in Hawaii, um, which has a similar constitutional provision. Um, and I think the logical, the logical next step beyond this small group of states that have these constitutional provisions is sort of extending these rights beyond just a right to a clean and healthful environment to other fundamental rights that we enjoy as American citizens that most other state constitutions have, um, like equal protection, uh, right to health and happiness, um, Montana also is not unique in having a constitutional provision that protects the rights of persons under 18. Um, so there are ways to get at these claims, uh, especially now that we have a really solid judicial opinion holding that the right to a clean and healthful environment exists. I think you're going to see a lot more of those connections being made in the future. Barbara, do you want to add anything? Um, and that was great. Yeah, so that kind of gets to a question I had for, for you guys. Um, oh, but I wanted to back up for a second. So the, the 72 uh, Montana provision, right, that's based off of um, NEPA and um, the Washington senator, um, um, I'm blanking on his name. Um, that introduced NEPA when it, the original NEPA legislation called for a right to a clean and healthy environment. Um, and the, so it, it's kind of embedded in, it got pulled out under the congressional debate, so it's like kind of embedded in our, our national legislation, even though it didn't quite make it fully through there. And I'm wondering if there's other pieces of jurisprudence that are beyond just that single clause of a right to a clean and healthy environment. And what I'm thinking about is like the Bolt decision here in Washington and that is there a space for that decision which gives the tribes of Washington 50%, you know, basically the right to hunt and fish in the, tra in the traditional homelands and that was interpreted as 50% of the, the salmon and steelhead in the state. And we could pretty easily demonstrate that salmon are greatly impacted by climate change. So would something like the Bolt decision be another avenue of bringing a case like this one? In other words, are there, do we have to sort of limit it to those six states that you mentioned or is there a whole sort of school of jurisprudence that we could sort of leverage um, to bring similar cases under a whole bunch of different sort of statutes and uh, legal decisions? I'll jump in again only because um, in my former life, I negotiated tribal and federal water rights. And so the bold decisions are familiar to me. And that's a, a really fascinating question. Um, I do think that tribal treaty rights are 
a bit of a different animal. I mean, for one thing, they're unique to tribes. Um, there is a small subset of tribes that have what are called Stevens treaties. They were negotiated by the first territorial governor of Washington, Isaac Stevens, and they have that um, right to hunt and fish in usual and accustomed places. We, the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes in um, northwestern Montana on the Flathead Indian Reservation are another group of tribes that have a Stevens Treaty and have that similar language. So I think on the one hand, um, yes, that could be a hook for some of the issues that were raised in this case. And actually, some of those um, environmental interests that are protected by treaties, and in particular by uh, the CSKT tribes treaty in this case, came up in the trial because we had um, a couple of the youth plaintiffs who had connections to the tribe or were tribal members and talked directly about impacts to not only the fulfillment of those uh what are called Aboriginal treaty rights, but also just um, cultural practices, the transferring of storytelling and language but from elder generations to younger generations. Um, so I think that, you know, there is that potential, but again, those rights, which are really at, at least um, in principle, legally incredibly strong, are very much limited to those treaty situations. Having said that, I do think that, um, you know, as I mentioned in response to the last question, um, the right to a clean and healthful environment, we also had claims under other constitutional provisions, uh, the right to equal protection of the laws. Um, and and the, the district court didn't get to those other constitutional claims because she didn't need to. The judge didn't need to get to those claims to decide the case. But they're there. They're part of the briefing in this case. And it's sort of the logical next step in terms of both the Juliana case, which I mentioned earlier, the federal case, um, another federal case that our Children's Trust recently filed against the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. And it, we're really seeing a proliferation um, not so much in terms of lawsuits yet. I think that will come once we have a decision from the Montana Supreme Court. But just in terms of the language of Judge Seeley's decision in this case, infiltrating many, many other venues. Um, a cousin of mine who's a lawyer in Massachusetts, a, a week after the opinion came out in our case, sent me a newspaper article about how a utility commission in Massachusetts had referenced the case in a proceeding on um, energy decisions that it was making. So I think it's hard to know exactly how this is going to play out legally, but I think it's going to be much broader uh, than this small subset of of states that have this type of constitutional language. And um, I'd love to turn it over to Barbara to talk a little bit more about, you know, how we see some of these issues playing out in Montana um, after we get a Supreme Court decision. Sure. And Melissa summarized that really well or answered that question. I think really um, the, uh, We'll see how how uh, what the next steps are, and we really um, we see this case and even the decision out of the state district court as really you know obviously it's precedent setting. This is the first youth climate uh, constitutional climate uh, case that's gone to trial um, and received a decision. And like Melissa said, that decision has has been quoted um, you know far and wide um, all across you know this country and others and. So here in Montana, what we're, you know, what we're hoping to see is really this kind of be the catalyst to start shifting the state of Montana to start considering climate and greenhouse gas emissions in their permitting. Um, and so, you know, that will then lead to kind of the question, like, what does that analysis look like? What does the Constitution require? Um, and so that will kind of be the next phase, at least as we see it, of litigation in Montana. Um, and, you know, like Melissa said there, you know, it's really hard to predict what we'll see going forward. But we see this case as kind of um, the beginning of, you know, starting the dominoes to fall to where, you know, climate change starts to take its place front and center in, in all of the cases um, um, that, that folks are bringing to protect um, constitutional rights. Let's go ahead and go to the audience. We have somebody out in the front here. If you could just mention your name and then ask your question. Yeah, my name is Marilyn, and um, I live in Spokane. 
And I think, uh, I think the way you framed your question uh, is really appropriate right now because I wanted to ask Eva, especially after the way you framed your question, my understanding, Eva, is that um, in spite of what some cynical adults have claimed, um, this really was instigated by you youth and not by the experts or adults looking for young people to have as their, um, you know, their forward-facing people to be able to bring lawsuits like this. This really did come from you young people seeking the right to a clean and healthful environment, correct? Um, yeah, so we, yeah, it was all our, it was something that we all sort of sought out. Um, it was an opportunity that did come up that we saw through our children's trust. Um, but yeah, it was all of us really wanted to do something about um, climate activism and we all cared about deeply about our local environments and um, a lot about our communities and our futures. And our futures right now are really uncertain. So having something to, yeah, we're, we're, it was our like, I think, yeah, I mean, I think everybody can mutually agree that all of us really want a better future for ourselves. So that was something that we definitely sought out ourselves. Do we have any Gonzaga students who might have a question? Let's see, uh, Patrick over here. If you, uh, you have to introduce yourself anyway. Hey there, I'm Patrick. I'm a senior at Gonzaga. Ava, I have a question for you. I can imagine um, I was not cool enough in middle school and high school to advocate for something like this um, in my free time. I can imagine um, it pro probably takes a lot of emotional of, of the energy um, and has a toll. And I don't want to ask anything, anything too personal, but I'm just curious, like, what has your experience been um, as a plaintiff in, in, in this case? And what have you learned? And how has it uh, af uh, affected yourself as a human? You know, I think being a part of this case has helped me learn a lot about myself. Um, when I started this out, you know, the case was in a, originally filed on my 14th birthday, and that's only been, that's almost four years now. And in that time, you know, I think a lot has changed. I think I've become, you know, a lot more confident. Um, at the beginning of this, I don't think I could have, I think, you know, I, I imagined testifying, but I didn't really, you know, I don't think I visualized it to the extent that it, actually was, you know, I think in a lot of ways it helped me sort of conquer some of my, some of my issues with anxiety. Um, and if you would have told me I could like talk on panels like this a couple of years ago, I would have probably just shook my head. <laughs> Others in the audience who might have a question, just introduce yourself. I'm Constance, and I was in Helena during the time of the trial. I couldn't, unfortunately, get into the courtroom, but just seeing the posters that said we support the Montana 16 all around town was so exciting, and it just was a different kind of air. And I'm wondering, um, with the decision, this positive decision, how has that impacted some of the other cases? Are you in contact with the other either other plaintiffs or the other attorneys, and what's been their feeling? I mean, I know that Montana still has a long way to go and that your government has been making statements about we're still coal and we're all coal, but I wonder how this has been for the other cases that are coming down the line, how this has um, impacted them. I was actually going to, um, curious if Eva has been in contact with other plaintiffs or has, um, been on other panels to share experiences. You know, I have not been in contact with very many plaintiffs. I was, um, I think I did an interview a couple months ago with, um, Isaac from the Juliana case. And it was really cool being able to sort of connect with him, um, because, you know, we're from different cases, but. We've all experienced really similar experiences through this legislation. Um, and I really, yeah, you know, it's, we're really, really hopeful that, you know, um, Juliana can finally get to go to trial because 
they've just been fighting and fighting and fighting. And um, I think that our case is definitely going to sort of improve those chances. And I guess I'd, I'd just offer as far as the attorneys go, um, really the um, the organization, Our Children's Trust, um, who is really spearheading this um, uh, litigation um, has done just a remarkable job of kind of bridging, you know, bringing lessons learned from this um, this case and there and others to kind of really inform next steps in the youth climate litigation. Um, and so I, it's been really um, neat to work with that group in order to kind of just see all the moving parts from other places. And you know, we were fortunate in Montana to be to go first and go go to trial first. And I um, and I think that's awesome. <laughs> and I think um, yeah, going forward, there's a lot of lessons learned from the um, this case that will be transferable to other states and other so litigation. Barbara or uh, Melissa, if this survives. Uh, the appeal and it and it goes through to the state supreme court and, you, and you're successful. Would it be obvious what the result would be in terms of the approving of new fossil fuel projects? Is it so? Let's say you win. Um, what would be the you know? Would you imagine it would be the end of fossil projects in the in the state? I wish. Um, you know, I I think that's like the the ideal vision of what's going to happen, but we've already gotten a taste of how the state has responded to the district's court's ruling. And we know based on the legislature that we've been watching for, you know, as long as Barbara and I have both lived in the state and um, just the actions that the state has taken since Judge Seeley's decision came down, I think they're going to fight this tooth and nail, and we're going to have to litigate every one of these things. And I think eventually, um, you know, assuming that we win on appeal, we will, through that subsequent litigation, lay out the ground rules for what the state actually has to do to um, make sure that they are protecting Montanans right to a clean and healthful environment. And that starts with MEPA, the Montana Environmental Policy Act, and the analysis that the state is supposed to do before it commits state natural resources in a way that can harm the environment. But there are obviously bigger repercussions in terms of what gets permitted and what doesn't. Um, the policy stances the state takes on energy development right now is very much pro-fossil fuels. And, you know, over time, through litigation, our hope is that we can turn the ship and put that balance on renewables, you know, both through the courts, through um public administrative bodies, such as our Public Service Commission that regulates utilities in the state. Um, but no, I, I I wish this was the silver bullet, but I don't believe that it is. Um, but having said that, it will be remarkable if, and I don't mean remarkable as in unlikely, a Supreme Court opinion upholding the plaintiffs on appeal will be a remarkable piece of legal reasoning, and it's going to enormously strengthen our hands in the fight against climate change in Montana and beyond. Yeah, so I just have a, a question, follow-up question to that. Um, I'll start out kind of weedy and then uh, interested in sort of the big picture maybe from Eva and you all. So... I didn't, wasn't clear what actually precipitated the lawsuit. Was was there a decision by DEQ, Department of Environmental Quality, about a particular mine or particular siding, a particular power plant? And it sounded like what you're saying is that DEQ didn't use MEPA to include effects of climate change. So I'm wondering, could the Supreme Court just simply say, okay, yeah, state of Montana, you need to address climate change in your in your in your environmental analysis, when you ever, whenever you do a, a NEPA or MEPA document, would and would that would that a take the sales out of the sort of argument, or would that be considered a win? And that's sort of my big picture question for you all: is is do you, do you have you already won? Uh, I think the answer to that is yes. 
we have one and we, we really won resoundingly. Um, and you know, not only was it a win in the courtroom, it was a win really in, you know, the court of public opinion. We've, you know, Eva and her co-plaintiffs were so, have been so, in, and continue to be so inspirational to um, all of us here in Montana and really, and, you know, across the world um, who have been following these young people and their journey. Um, and what precipitated the litigation is not, it wasn't a specific, um, you know, coal mine permit or oil refinery air permit, although, you know, the, there are plenty of those to choose from here. Um, really, the basis was, um, you know, these the acts that the state does, these aggregate acts that the state does in promoting fossil fuels and, you know, not just one permit, but, you know, as was, you know, one of the themes in the trial is the state of Montana never saw a fossil fuel permit it didn't want to grant. Um, and so, you know, that was, it was more of kind of the, the big picture, the cumulative um, nature of the state's kind of adherence to this, this really, you know, goal to, to permit these activities without considering with, you know, not only ignoring, but being forced to ignore by the state law, forced to ignore the climate impacts that the state knew was occurring um, with, with each of these um, facilities. So that's really what precipitated this litigation here. Take a question uh, from a uh, listener online and then and return to the room and just momentarily. Uh, so one of our students, uh, Olivia, uh, here at Gonzaga, but, but not in the room, asks, uh, my question is why didn't the state of Montana use the climate deniers that you said they had at the ready? Why did they focus more on the pretrial and actually decision rather than their arguments? Uh, that is an interesting point that you mentioned. Just maybe elaborate a little bit more about that. I can take a stab at that. Um, you know, the state never gave a reason for um, refusing to call the expert that it had hired at enormous expense at trial. And right up until essentially the the week that our, it, each side was supposed to have a week to present their case. And we took the full week and the state took a day. Um, but right up until the conclusion of our case, you know, there was a question of whether they were going to present the evidence. And Eva can really speak to this. They certainly drilled down on these issues during the plaintiff's depositions. They went after them for driving cars, um, various aspects of their lives that might contribute to uh, fossil fuels being combusted. It, it, there were some low blows, honestly. And I think that particularly once they got to trial and they saw how powerful, to use Eva's term, the storytelling was of these plaintiffs telling their stories, which were just incredibly moving and powerful. Um, it would be a bad look to, and then, and then these incredibly accomplished scientists getting up and giving the data, verifying everything that the plaintiffs said in their stories. Um, that it wouldn't have been a good look to try and attack that. It, you know, I think they knew they were fighting an uphill battle. And in fact, they ultimately decided not to even cross-examine the plaintiffs at trial. I, I think again, because they knew it wouldn't be a good look. Um, but just to go back to Bar what Barbara said previously in terms of we won, a huge win, and, and it may not seem this way, but it really is if you live in Montana, is just the fact that the state went from attacking climate change science during the pretrial phase of this case to actually acknowledging in the courtroom the science that we had presented and saying, we're not disputing that. Like, that in itself is a huge win. Um, so, you know, I, I think they saw the writing on the wall and that trying to make that argument after the plaintiffs put on their case and it was an incredibly strong case and it was science-backed that they made the decision that trying to attack that was not going to be successful. That's my hypothesis. I'd love to hear Eva's perspective on this because she sat through a real grilling in her deposition um, and, you know, probably talked to her fellow plaintiffs about their ex experiences that were the same. Yeah, I think, Melissa, you put it really well. Um, 
I, yeah, during my deposition, I felt it was, yeah, there was a lot of, as, as she put it, low blows, um, just asking like what kind of furnace we had in our house and yeah. How much do you use your car? When was the last time you went on a vacation and, uh, took a plane anywhere? Um, there were just, you know, it was just kind of constant question after question like that. And the problem with that is it was really sort of detracting from, you know, it's like, well, that's not really, that's not really the focus. <laughs> um, so it's just, you know, kind of my interpretation of it is they're just kind of looking for anything that they could sort of grab onto, but it wasn't uh, from our, yeah, from my interpretation, it didn't appear so much as to you know, like, Oh, so yeah, it didn't seem so much as um, it felt like really, it's like, oh, I see what you're doing. You know, it was kind of, it felt like it was pretty easy to sort of see through what they were kind of going for, and it didn't look super strong. Hi, my name is Bill. Um, I had the privilege of driving from Coeur d'Alene and being in Helena for the, uh, the first week that each of you testified. Um, I'm writing a book called Losing Home um, based on where I live in Coeur d'Alene and having lived there, I'm a fourth generation resident of Coeur d'Alene, and it feels like we're live, losing what we love about living there. Um, Eva, I don't know uh, Montana geography very well, but since the, since the Held um, case was heard and the judge um, gave her ruling, Montana has tried to get a, um, a natural gas uh, power plant off the Yellow, near the Yellowstone River, and I don't know how far Livingston is from that, but could you give us an update about that? It just goes back to Montana fighting continually. Uh, they just wanted to be able to get this natural gas plant permitted before the um, Supreme Court ruled. So I, I'd kind of like to get some idea of, of some dates for some of these things happening in the future, and uh, really a privilege to hear um, Eva and everyone else be able to speak. Thank you. Um, well, for starters, I think that uh, Melissa or Barbara may have more information on um, the power plant proposed in Laurel. Um, yeah, so that is on the Yellowstone River, and that's probably an hour and a half away from where I live in Livingston. Um, yeah, that hearing about that was kind of heavy because, um, you know, the Yellowstone River, um, I spoke about it actually a lot in my testimony um, in my connection to that river. Uh, it means a lot to me. Um, cause I've lived in Livingston for most of my life now and I spend my summers on that river. Um, I walk along that river almost every day. You know, there's just a very deep connection and a lot of my childhood is associated with that river. Um, so seeing that put under threat kind of, it's, it's really sort of, you know, it's, it, it's heavy and it's, it's worrisome. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that things will turn out. Um, Barbara and Melissa, do you have anything to add about the power plant? Yeah, I would just add um, that's a it's a really interesting um, you know kind of point uh, that you know as we're you know litigating this case on behalf of even her plaintiffs, co-plaintiffs, um, this you know kind of an example, a very stark example of what we're trying to prevent is is trying to be is DEQ is trying to permit at the same time and. That case is also up on appeal to the Montana Supreme Court. The air, Montana air, air quality permit, um, the environmental analysis for that was challenged um, successfully at the district court level. And so that's up on appeal um, with the Montana Supreme Court as well. Um, and so it'll um, it'll be interesting to see how those how our two cases kind of you know, basically they're before the court at the same time. And, you know, really what the, the Supreme Court will do with this kind of very stark example of the exact harm we're trying to prevent um, through this other, uh, through our litigation uh, on behalf of the plaintiffs. So um, that's all kind of to be determined. Um, I'm Landon, age um, 10, almost 11. And I was just curious, um, about like, um, do you think there would be like an effect on our energy and electricity if you were to remove the fossil fuels? I'm not saying like I'm I'm supporting fossil fuels, but I'm just saying would there be an effect? Um. 
I'm happy to jump in on that one just because we, a lot of the other work we do at Welk is um, litigating fossil fuel extraction in particular on the part of the U.S. government and, and state government actions. And that's a really great question. And it's a real question. I mean, we have built a national economy and a national energy economy that is very much dependent on fossil fuels. And you can't just to use a, an electrical metaphor, you can't just flip the switch on that. Um, one of the things that we advocated for in this case and really advocate for in all of the cases that we litigate challenging fossil fuel production is a what we call a just transition, a transition to clean and renewable energy that doesn't disproportionately impact people who are already vulnerable, and those are the people who are being most impacted by climate change, and that also gives us the time that we need to put that infrastructure in place um, to make the transition in a way that's going to be effective and not chaotic. And as one of our experts testified at trial, technologically, we absolutely have the ability right now that we have the technology to, to replace all of the fossil fuel energy that we use with clean energy or with renewable energy. But we don't. what we don't have is the infrastructure in place. And one of the things that Judge Seeley found in her ruling in this case was that the, the technological feasibility is there, the political will to make that transition happen is not. And so that's one of the things that we just have to keep pounding away at. And again, yeah, that transition cannot happen overnight. And it's already happening to some extent um, just through the economy. The economy is supporting a transition to renewable energy because by and large, it's cheaper. Um, it's much cheaper than coal. It's getting to be cheaper than uh, methane gas. Um, so we're getting there, but we're just not getting there fast enough. And we will make the transition and we have the capacity to do it, but you're right. Uh, and that's a really good point. It, it doesn't happen overnight. And that's why we need our governments to get behind it and support us in that transition rather than fighting a tooth and nail. So to wrap us up, I have two questions for, for Eva. Uh, so the first one is, what advice would you give a young person who's worried about climate change, given your experience? So that, I'll just throw that one to you first, and you can answer, and then I have a second. All right. Um, so I think when it comes, climate change is a really huge issue, right? You know, it's it's something that's hard to process, especially when you're young and um, being so uncertain about your future. It's really kind of it's nerve wracking and it's a lot to sort of try and figure out all on your own. I would say, you know, trying to talk to your family if they agree with, um, if they're supportive of that sort of thing. And, um, I think just, you know, looking for ways to talk about it, um, look to your local community, see if there are like green clubs or ways you can, little ways you can get involved. Um, if it helps, yeah, just trying to do what you can, um, but also, you know, just sort of, you have to, you have to, despite everything, you kind of just have to stay hopeful and you have to look for the good in things, you know, you have to be optimistic and it's, it's, it's really difficult and it's a lot to process. And just, I think, talking through it with other people and um, doing what you can to take care of yourself, that has really helped me. Great answer. <laughs> Thank you, Eva. My last question is, is there any chance you'd come to Gonzaga? I'd love to give you a tour. Um, any, any chance you want to be a Zag? <laughs> hey, well, you know, that's good to know. I might have to take you up on that offer. I hope you do. Thank you all so much for being with us uh, tonight. We're glad we were able to work the technology. Uh, thank you for all of the work that Welk is doing uh, as a law firm in the West. Uh, preserving and protecting the wild spaces we care so much about. This is the second time we've been able to invite them recently. Thank you, Eva, for you and your, your plaintiffs for all of your leadership. And I hope to see uh, all of you at a future event uh, real soon. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you so much for inviting us.